I'm Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant and question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. To Jesse. Jesse. It's the 19th anniversary of the attacks on September the 11th, 2001, that killed thousands of people on American soil and launched a wave of endless wars. Today, we discuss the fate of the whistleblowers who exposed government crimes in the aftermath of 9-11. Sit tight. The show starts now. The world according to Jesse, Jesse, Jesse. Hi, I'm Brigitte Santos. For our top story today, a federal appeals court has ruled that military prisoners at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, are not entitled to due process. The decision could impact the upcoming trial of five men charged with planning and supporting the deadliest terror attack on American soil, including the alleged 9-11 architect Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. That trial is scheduled to begin at Gitmo in January next year. Mohammed and four other defendants were captured in Pakistan in 2002 and 2003. They were detained at CIA black sites and then sent to the U.S. military prison in Cuba. Their trial has been held up for nearly two decades, largely due to the revelations about the CIA torture program at some of those black sites and whether or not any details about it can be discussed in court. Defense lawyers argue that the so-called enhanced interrogation program resulted in coerced statements and false confessions, while the prosecution claims those confessions were not tainted by torture. Jesse, either way, the families of 9-11 victims have yet to see any real justice, and the only person prosecuted over that torture program was CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou, who was imprisoned for publicly confirming the agency's use of waterboarding and other torture tactics. What do you think about all this, you know, 19 years later? Well, I'll tell you, Brigitte, it's shameful. It's shameful that John Kiriakou, an American hero, a man with integrity, a man who took his oath and did his job, was sent to prison for exposing war crimes. Because these are war crimes, trust me. Waterboarding. I've been waterboarded. So I know what it is. I got it at Sears School, Survival, Escape, Resistance, and Evasion. It was a required school that you had to go to before you could go in the combat zone of Vietnam. A required school. We were all essentially waterboarded there. I can assure you, as a former competitive swimmer and as a f graduate of Class 58 Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL training, that waterboarding is torture. It is torture, plain and simple. It's not enhanced interrogation like Dick Cheney tried to label it. It is torture. And that's what we did. Now, in the case of Sheikh Mohammed, I heard they, they waterboarded him like about 140 times. Now, I'll tell you this. If any one of us were waterboarded 140 times, all of us would confess to 9-11 too. You would have to. There's no way you could withstand that torture. Well, and if they are guilty, isn't it sad that this torture program could potentially have tainted any trial that could actually get justice for these victims? Oh, absolutely, because all, all evidence brought under torture isn't allowed in a court of law. That's why technically police cannot torture you. When you go to court, see, Anything you gain, any knowledge or information you gain from torture has, has no credibility because the tortured person is going to say whatever is required to stop the torture. So they're going to confess to anything. We all would. If I can guarantee you, everybody out there, if you're waterboarded enough times, you will confess to anything. So all these confessions to me are bogus because they were achieved under torture. Nearly 3,000 people died in the attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon on September 11, 2001. Washington then used the war on terror to justify endless wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, Syria, and so on. Meanwhile, nearly 200,000 people have died on American soil this year due to COVID-19. Experts predict the death toll will double by January 1st of next year. 
Instead of waging a war on the virus, members of Congress are still waging a war on their political opponents. Why the disconnect? You got me. I don't know why. This is a nonpartisan issue when you talk about the pandemic, and both sides should be working together to end it. Partisan politics has no place in this. In related news, a federal appeals court has ruled that the NSA's warrantless bulk data collection program launched after 9-11 is illegal and that intelligence officials lied when defending it. According to the ruling, the program violates the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and possibly the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden exposed the program back in 2013, and he's lived in Russia under political asylum ever since. Despite the latest ruling, Snowden still faces espionage charges back in the U.S. In response to this decision, he tweeted, quote, Seven years ago, as the news declared I was being charged as a criminal for speaking the truth, I never imagined I would live to see our courts condemn the NSA's activities as unlawful and, in the same ruling, credit me for exposing them. What's your reaction to how whistleblowers are treated even after the crimes that they expose are upheld in the courts? Horrible. They treat them horribly. They still treat them like they're criminals. I say on the end of the show every week, when the government lies, the truth becomes a traitor. Snowden is called a traitor because he exposed the truth. The truth. So the truth gets you in trouble now from the U.S. government. Well, what that shows you is the government's in the business of lying. They do it quite often. You know, they lied about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They lied about ties to al-Qaeda in Iraq. They lied about the Gulf of Tonkin incident that started the Vietnam War. The lies go on and on and on. And then they wonder why people like me question the government today. We have to question the government. They lie too much to us. They lie all the time. And they lie on things that affect our everyday lives. Snowden exposed illegal activities by our government, but do you think he'll ever be pardoned? Uh, only if I become president. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, seriously. No, I, I, I really don't see it happening. You don't see anybody saying they're going to do it in their campaign. You don't hear Biden say nothing about it. You don't hear President Trump say nothing about it. So I highly doubt he's going to ever be pardoned unless somebody else gets into office and has the, the, the power to pardon him and someone who truly looks at what he did as not breaking the law but doing the right thing for the country of the United States called telling the truth. As the appeals court sides with Snowden in the U.S., the extradition hearing for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange begins in London. Assange has been fighting against a U.S. extradition request since last year. American prosecutors have charged him with 17 counts of violating the Espionage Act and one count of computer intrusion for obtaining and publishing classified U.S. military documents via WikiLeaks in 2010. The diplomatic cables were leaked to the publisher by Army private turned whistleblower Chelsea Manning. New charges have also been slapped on Assange, accusing him of a conspiring with hackers from the group Anonymous and working to help Edward Snowden flee the United States. If Assange is extradited to the U.S., he faces up to 175 years in prison. Chelsea Manning's 35-year prison sentence was commuted by Barack Obama back in 2017. Now, Trump could do the same thing for Assange, and, you know, he seems to want to compete with Obama here, so it's possible, um, but it's probably not going to happen, is it? And if it did, what message would that send to the American public? I don't know, but it should happen. You know, again, here we go. Uh, 175 years in prison, 175 for exposing the truth. You get sentenced to 175 years in prison. That should send a clear message to all whistleblowers out there, you better keep your mouth shut or the American government's going to stick it to you and they're going to stick it to you big time. How could anything they do warrant 175 years in prison? I don't even know of anyone. Brigida, has anyone ever lived that long? How long did Methuselah live? You know, <laughs> who could possibly live 175 years? And that's what he's sentenced to for exposing the truth? I guess the U.S. government's telling you, ooh, the truth hurts, and we're going to make it hurt. 
It's time for a quick break. When we return, we switch gears when Jesse sits down with Adam Alter to discuss the rise of technology addiction. We'll be right back. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. I'm now joined by best-selling author Adam Alter to discuss the tech addiction epidemic in his latest book, Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. Adam, you say that modern technology is addictive. Is there a biological reason for this? When we engage with modern tech, it's designed to introduce little rewards, little doses of rewards over time. And those rewards pr provoke certain responses in the brain, which mimic the responses you'd get if you were a drug addict taking a drug. It's a very similar kind of response. So as a result, we keep getting these little doses of dopamine and the these little bursts of reward. And, and that basically main, means that these experiences are very much like the experiences of taking a drug. Now, prior to the internet and computers, Expert, experts worried about TV addiction, and before that, they worried about getting hooked on the radio, and so on. So is tech addiction something we should truly be concerned about? I think it's something worth being concerned about. I think there are important differences between the addictions or the potential addictions that people were concerned about with respect to TV and radio and the, the addictions to the screens we have now. You know, one thing that's different is behind the screens we use now, there are thousands of very, very smart people who are doing their very best to hook us. It's actually a, prof a profession now. You can, you can spend many, many years at large tech organizations doing everything you can to weaponize your products to make them hard for us to resist. Now, TV was always designed to engage us and to, to be something that we, want, we wanted to pay a lot of attention to, but it was never engaging in the same way. It was never designed explicitly to hook us. The, also, the rate of evolution, the, the degree of sophistication in the products that are being released on, particularly on smartphones and on tablets, is so much greater than anything we've ever encountered in any other screen space like TVs or, or radio or any media, really. And so I think there are some reasons to be more concerned about the current forms of screens that we're engaging with than, than the screens we engaged with before. Now, when it comes to all the gadgets we have today, is there one in particular that people are most addicted to? Yeah, I think it's the smartphone. And the biggest reason for that is, you know, people often say I would never allow someone to implant tech in my body or in my brain. But 75% of us say that we can reach our smartphones 24 hours a day without moving our feet. So these devices might not be physically implanted, but they functionally are a part of our bodies. They're always wherever we go. And we know that things are more addictive or more difficult for us to resist to the extent that they're very nearby, that they're close to us. So I think um, it's got to be the smartphone that's the winner today. And we spend five, six, seven hours a day, many of us more than that even on our phones every day. We're, we're basically giving 20 years of our lives to these devices. Well, I got to tell you something, Adam. I should have told you this at the top of the, uh, the interview. I've never owned a cell phone and I'm computer illiterate. So all of this is new to me, and I don't think I'll get addicted. Anyway, <laughs> do game and app developers intentionally make their products addictive? Is it intentional? Yeah, I think it is. I, I don't know if they would describe it as addictive, but I think they're trying to make their, their products as engaging as possible, and they're trying to compete with other companies that are trying to, to capitalize on our attention. So every minute that I'm not on one particular social media app, there's probably another social media app that I'll spend my time on. And so there's this kind of war back and forth among all of these large tech corporations. They're all fighting for limited time. We all only have 24 hours a day and only some of that is gonna be waking hours, obviously. And so they're constantly wrestling for that time. Um, and so I think, yes, it's very purposeful. If you look at the kinds of decisions they make, they will privilege, say, the placement of a button or the color of a button or the way they deliver rewards or the kinds of different interaction styles they, they foster on their programs all with the ultimate goal of ensuring that we spend as much time as possible on their platforms. Now, how does tech addiction hinder us? Does it affect our empathy or the way we interact with others? Yeah, it does. It's, uh, I think its biggest effects are social. Uh, you know, tech has changed the way we socialize. That's especially true for young people, but it's also true for, for middle-aged and older adults as well. It's really true across the board. It's especially concerning, I think, for young kids because the way kids learn how to interact with others in the world is through repeated interactions. You know, a kid takes another kid's toy, gets bopped on the head, realizes that's probably not the best thing to be doing. But you need those face-to-face -face experiences. <laughs> and so, you know, if you rob kids of those experiences, they're, they're missing out on some very important developmental milestones. 
And then of course for adults, you know, the quality of, of interactions in marriages, uh, you look at what happens at dinner tables at restaurants, people just aren't engaging in the same way. And I think it's, it's leading us to lead a, an impoverished social existence, which is, I think, much weaker than the kinds of connections that our, our ancestors enjoyed for, for really thousands of years, maybe even more than that. So I think it is concerning on that front. You know, we, we've, we've watered down our social interactions in a way that just wasn't true before now. Now, in your opinion, has the pandemic increased our dependence on technology? And is this a good thing? So yes, it has increased our dependence on technology. Um, I, I think technology in some sense has been miraculous for us during the pandemic because um, where we can't be physically near other people, we've been able to be socially close to them by having screens. And so we use the term social distancing. The good news is I think it's mostly physical distancing. And because of screens, because of Zoom, because of FaceTime, because of Skype and other programs, we've still been able to, to keep quite socially close to the people who matter to us. So I would never want to say or claim that screens are all bad. I don't think they rob us entirely of, of well-being. I think they also bring many good things into our lives. My family's in Australia. I'm just outside of New York City. It's a long way away, but I, I'm very lucky to be able to enjoy contact. My kids can enjoy contact with their grandparents, their uncle, their cousins. We wouldn't be able to do that without screens. And now we're all in that position because of the, the pandemic. We're all separated by space. And so I think screens have actually been in some sense quite good for us, but we've also been forced to spend more of our time, especially during working hours on screens. And I think that's, that's unfortunate. I think it makes us less productive and probably makes us a bit less happy. You, you engage a lot of attentional resources when you look at someone on a screen. You know, if I look away, it looks like I'm bored. But when I'm in a room with you and I look away, we just kind of assume that's part of the natural flow of social interaction. And so when people are on screens, they're constantly zooming their attention in. And that's that's an intense and unnatural experience. And a lot of us do that for hours and hours of the day. So I think being on screens for many hours a day is quite hard for a lot of people. Now, many children are now going to school virtually with online platforms. How will this impact their long term relationship with technology? It's interesting. I don't, I don't know how it will change how they feel about tech. Um, I think there's a good chance that they will they will see technology a bit more negatively because they'll associate it with schooling, with being distant from their friends. I, I know that my my experience with my own kids and, and looking at other kids in my neighborhood and speaking to them and their parents, the experience of being schooled online is, is really tricky. It's difficult. There are a lot of temptations outside of the screen. You know, you want to go play. You'd rather do other things. You'd rather be outside if the weather's good. And so I, I think the screen feels almost like a chore or a task that's drawing you away from things that might be more engaging or enjoyable. And, and so I think a lot of the kids are now seeing screens and the, the experience of being schooled online as, as kind of robbing them of the time to do the things they'd really rather be doing. Whereas when they're in school proper, they're actually in a building, they're with other people, the, the interaction style is, is different and I think more enriching and rewarding. So I, you know, one possibility is that at the end of this, kids say, I don't wanna use screens as much as kids did before the pandemic because um, I associate screen use with, with this period of, of kind of difficulty of being separated from my friends and not being able to be, to be able to play and run around with them, which is not pleasant, obviously. Now, how do you know if you're addicted to technology? What are the warning signs? Well, there are a few. You know, the good news is a lot of tech now gives us feedback. So if you use a phone, a smartphone, you'll get feedback every week that says, you spend six hours on your phone on average each day. So this week you gave up, say, 42 hours of your life to your screen. Um, just the numbers alone tell us a lot. And I think a lot of people see those numbers and feel shocked at how much time they're giving up to those screens. So that's part of it. I think it's more than that, though. You know, if you're if you're in a relationship with someone, if you're married, if you if you have a girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever, and, and you're sitting on a couch with someone, you know, I sit with my wife sometimes and we notice that we, we both have our phones out and hours pass by. And instead of being with each other in the same room, we're effectively separated and we're just staring at our own screens. And we know that's not good for our relationship. And I, I think a lot of us have that insight that our relationships and our, our, our social experiences are being diminished because we have screens around. And so if you feel that a large part of your day, you know, you're not spending enough time outdoors, you're not getting up off the couch because you're glued to a TV or a smartphone or a computer, you're, you're not really engaging with your spouse or your friends and your family. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to intuitively feel that this is a problem. And most people, when you ask them, can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this. And when they try to reduce how long they spend on these platforms, whether they're social media sites or whatever they're doing on screens, um, 
it's difficult for them. They find it difficult to resist. And so I think we have that intuition. You can tell when it's a problem for us. Now, technology is now part of life. How can we have a healthier relationship with it? I think the best thing to do is to carve out parts of the day that, that are explicitly tech free, where we say to ourselves, you know, maybe it's dinner time. Maybe you say every time I have dinner, I'm going to put my phone in a different room or I'm going to have a little box and the whole family puts the phone in the box and then we can enjoy dinner. We can actually have a conversation, that, that novel idea of actually communicating with other people. Um, another alternative is to say, you know, for, for much of the day, I'm going to turn the data function off on my phone so that I can use it as a camera, but I'm not constantly getting emails and text messages. Um, and therefore, you can use some of the features, the utilities, without actually using it as a phone. Some people do that on weekends to, to really engage with their families without having to worry about constantly um, receiving text messages and emails and things like that. So really, it's about setting boundaries and developing habits of use where we accept that phones are here to stay, as you say. They're going to be a part of our lives forever, probably. Um, and that's okay as long as there are boundaries that allow us to preserve some of our time and to, to connect with other people, go out in nature, exercise, do the things that are important for humans to thrive that I think are more and more difficult as we spend more time on screens. Adam Alter, I want to thank you for helping us take a closer look at our tech-ridden lifestyles. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much for your expertise. Thanks for having me, Jesse. I appreciate it. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. Let's turn to the viewers. We asked people online, since the court sided with Snowden, should he be pardoned? Joey says a pardon is the least of what he's due. Mr. Snowden exemplifies what the founding fathers wanted this government and country to be and retain. Jesse? I agree wholeheartedly. He is an American hero, in my opinion, for exposing what he exposed and to be uh, sentenced to live the rest of his life in Russia because for fear he's going to go to prison here is ridiculous, utterly ridiculous, when he told the truth. So the truth can now get you in trouble, I guess. And user Orthodox Deacon goes the opposite way. He says is a contracted employee with the IC. He swore an oath and was entrusted to protect sensitive information by providing said information to foreign parties. He violated every single intelligence directive he swore to uphold. He is a spy, no clemency. What do you, what's your response really? to that? Really? Well, what is the oath he took? Is the oath he took like the one I took in the military, an oath to the Constitution of the United States? Because the United States was violating the Constitution, and the Constitution is the biggest law of the land. So him exposing constitutional violations, how could his oath be any bigger than an oath you take to the Constitution? I would like to see what Mr. Snowden's oath actually was, because if it's the same one you take like you do in the military, then you're loyal to the Constitution of the United States of America, and when that's being violated, it is your job to expose that violation because you took that oath. Thanks for watching. Send us your comments on Facebook and Twitter for a chance to be featured next week when, as always, we cover more stories ignored by the corporate media. And remember, and today's a great show for it, when the government lies, the truth becomes a traitor. Stay vigilant, people. The world according to Jesse. Jesse. Jesse.